subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everybody, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we shall be analyzing the Hindu newspaper dated 24th of July 2021 of the New Delhi edition. The topics to be discussed today have been presented on the screen. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Let us begin our today's discussion. The first article in today's newspaper appears on page number 6 in the form of an editorial. The article is titled as the Ganga's message. We all know that the river Ganga is of unique importance to us because of geographical, historical, socio-cultural and economic reasons. That is why we have declared the river Ganga as our national river. However, the river Ganga is in turn facing a number of problems, particularly with respect to the water pollution. This particular editorial here specifically talks about the growing microplastic pollution. See, the concept of microplastic has already been discussed in yesterday's DNS. So, I will not be discussing the concept of microplastics once again. Rather, we will take this as an opportunity to carry out a critical analysis of the Namami Gange program. So, from the perspective of the prelims examination, we will understand as to what are the pillars and the institutional mechanism for the Namami Gange. And as far as the mains examination is concerned, we look into the achievements, the problems and challenges with respect to the implementation of this particular program. Further, as you can see, in the previous year prelims examination, questions have been asked with respect to various aspects of rivers. Particularly, questions have been asked with respect to the origin of the rivers, the course of the rivers, in particular, the important places located along the banks of the rivers, the important tributaries of the rivers and so on. So we will look into these aspects from the perspective of the Ganga river basin as well. And at the end of our discussion, you should be in a position to attend these four prelims based questions for the practice. And the main space question for the practice from this particular topic here could be, examine the concerns and challenges in the implementation of the Namami Gange program what more needs to be done to improve the outcomes of this particular program. So let's first start off with the Ganga river basin. See when we say the river basin, it not only includes the river Ganga, but it also includes the important tributaries of the Ganga river. The Ganga river basin is considered to be the largest in terms of catchment, wherein it accounts for almost one fourth of our area and support almost half of our population. It is spread across the three countries of India, Nepal and Bangladesh. And as you can see, the Ganga river basin as such covers almost around 11 states. When you look at the course of the river Ganga, the boxes which have been highlighted in the light bluish color, these are the important rivers in the Ganga river basin. Whereas the boxes which have been highlighted the light green color, they are the important places. So as you can see here, the river Ganga comes into being due to the confluence of two smaller rivers known as Bhagirathi and Alaknanda. These two rivers meet at a place known as Devaprayag. So beyond Devaprayag, the Ganga river comes into being. Further, as you can see, a number of smaller rivers join Alaknanda. These include Mandakini, Mandakini joins Alaknanda at Rudrapayak, Dali Ganga at Vishnu Prayak, Pindar at Karna Prayak, Nandakini at Nanda Prayak. So beyond Deva Prayak, Ganga starts flowing. It passes through important cities such as Rishikesh, Haridwar, etc. before entering into Uttar Pradesh. In Uttar Pradesh, it is joined by Ram Ganga and Gomati on its left bank. So as you can see, Ram Ganga joins at a place known as Kanoj. Gomti joins Ganga at a place known as Gazipur. On its right bank, it is joined by the river Yamna at Allahabad. After Uttar Pradesh, the river Ganga then enters into Bihar. In Bihar, on its left bank, it is joined by a number of rivers originating from Himalaya. These include Ghagra, Gandak, Buri Gandak, Kosi. It is also joined by the Son River on its right bank. 
Beyond Bihar, the river Ganga then takes a southward turn. It enters into Jharkhand and then into West Bengal. In West Bengal, the river Ganga then splits into two rivers, Padma and Hooghly. The Padma river then enters into Bangladesh, whereas the river Hooghly goes on to become Bhagirathi before flowing into the Bay of Bengal. So these are the important tributaries as well as the important places along the Ganga river basin. In particular, please make a note of the important confluences points before the Ganga river comes into being. Now coming to the Namami Gange program, we all know that the river Ganga has been undergoing the rapid degradation on account of industrialization, urbanization, religious offerings and so on. This in turn has affected approximately around 400 million people who are directly and indirectly dependent upon the river Ganga. It has also affected the associated biodiversity. In particular, it has affected the species such as the Gangetic Dolphin. Hence, in order to control the growing water pollution and to focus upon the conservation and rejuvenation of river Ganga, the government has launched the Namami Gange program in the year 2014-15 with an initial outlay of rupees 20,000 crores. See, if you have to focus on cleaning of river Ganga, multiple ministries at the central level would have to be involved. So we would have to involve ministries such as the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Ministry of Rural Development, Ministry of Urban Development, Ministry of Power, Ministry of Water Resources and so on. Similarly, there is a need for having coordination as well as cooperation at different levels. Center and state must cooperate. Further, there is need to have cooperation between the multiple states. There is a need to have coordination and cooperation at the lowest levels, that is at the level of urban local bodies. Hence, the Namami Kange program focuses on having a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach. So the idea here is to bring all the stakeholders, all the important sectors on a single platform and fulfill the twofold objective of controlling the pollution and to carry out the rejuvenation of river Ganga. This program is in turn based upon some important pillars. The first pillar is about establishing the sewerage treatment plants. So the idea here is to ensure that the pollutants are not directly let out into river Ganga. Rather, before letting it out into river, these pollutants need to be treated. The second one is the riverfront development, which focuses on construction and modernization of ghats along the river. The third one is sur river surface cleaning which focuses on the removal of the solid pollutants which are floating on the river. The next is biodiversity, which focuses upon the conservation of certain identified species such as the Gangetic Dolphin. Next one is afforestation. Next is conducting workshops as well as conferences in order to enhance the public awareness and to ensure that the Namami Gange program is basically a community driven program Next is regular inspection and monitoring of industries located along the river Ganga. This is to ensure that the industries are not letting out their pollutants into river. And if they are doing so, these industries should be penalized heavily. And last is the Ganga Gram, which focuses on ensuring that the villages which are located along the river Ganga, these villages should get the status of the open defecation free. So the idea here is to ensure that the villages located along the river Ganga do not practice the open defecation and we should construct the toilets in such villages. So as far as the institutional structure is concerned, we have basically a five tier institutional structure. At the highest level, we do have the National Ganga Council, which is headed by the Prime Minister. It includes the relevant union ministers as well as the chief ministers of the Ganga Basin states. See, prior to National Ganga Council earlier, we used to have the National Ganga River Basin Authority. This authority was set up by the government under the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act. So under this particular act, the government had come up with the rules and regulations to set up this particular authority. But in the year 2016, the government came up with the new rules. As per the new rules, this authority has been dissolved 
and in its place now we have the national ganga council below the national ganga council we have the empowered task force which is headed by the union minister for water resources then we have the national mission for clean ganga which basically acts as an implementation arm for the national ganga council and it is headed by the director general at a state level we have the state ganga committee and at the district level we have the district ganga committee and as you can see here with respect to controlling the pollution in the river ganga the government has already taken a number of steps for example for the first time ever the government came up with the ganga action plan in the year 1985 then in the year 1996 it came up with the national river conservation plan then in the year 2008 we decided to give the status of national river to ganga and then in the year 2014 15 we came up with the namami gange program then in the year 2016 we decided to replace the national ganga river basin authority with the national ganga council now coming to various concerns and challenges with respect to namami gange the first concern and challenge is with respect to sewage treatment as highlighted before the sewage treatment is considered to be one of the founding pillar of namami gange according to various estimates we need a sewage treatment capacity of at least around 2000 million liters per day a sewage treatment capacity of 2000 million liters per day would ensure that whatever sewage is getting generated all of that sewage will be treated and no sewage will be able to enter the river ganga without getting treated now by the end of 2019 we have constructed a large number of sewage treatment plants which is obviously a huge achievement but if you add up the capacity of all of these sewage treatment plants which we have constructed so far this would be hardly like 330 million liters per day so look at the capacity that we need we need a capacity of 2000 million liters per day but look at the capacity which we have been able to generate so far hardly like 330 million liters per day which means that even today we have not been able to construct a large number of sewage treatment plants so this is basically on account of delays in construction of these plants such delays takes place because of the land acquisition problem delays in environmental clearances and so on so going forward we need to ensure that there is a time bound clearances for the completion of these sewage treatment plants apart from that in a large number of cities we have constructed the sewage treatment plants but the problem here is these sewage treatment plants are not being able to function at their optimum capacity now for example let's say in a particular city a we may have constructed a sewage treatment plant with a capacity of say 10 million liters per day however this particular sewage treatment plant may be able to function only at a capacity of 1 million liters per day so look at the potential that we have created we have set up a sewage treatment plant which can actually treat a sewage of 10 million liters per day but right now it is operating only at 1 million liters per day question is why now ideally in large cities when we construct a sewage treatment plant the entire sewage network in the city should get connected to such treatment plants in case if the sewage does not get connected to the treatment plants this sewage can get diverted into the river ganga more importantly these sewage treatment plants will not be able to function at their optimal capacity so instead of a capacity of 10 million liters per day it will function only at 1 million liters per day so this is mainly on account of poor sewage network in cities so going forward we need to improve the sewage network and ensure that the entire sewage network in the city is getting connected to the treatment plants we need to ensure that no sewage is getting out into the river ganga without getting treated apart from that we need to ensure the strict monitoring of industries to ensure that the pollutants are not getting out into the river ganga more importantly we need to encourage public private partnership in the construction of the sewage plants particularly it can be a model which can be successful in the larger cities 
the second concern and challenge is with respect to minimum ecological flow see we all know that the rivers have a capability to self purify themselves the rivers can self purify themselves by maintaining minimum flow if a river is able to maintain the minimum flow then even if pollutants are there the river would have a good quality of water on the other hand if a river is unable to maintain the minimum ecological flow in that particular case even a small percentage of pollutants can drastically decrease the water quality the what has happened in case of the river ganga is that it has not been able to maintain the minimum ecological flow except during the monsoons for example according to a study carried out by iit kharagpur there has been a decrease in the base flow of the river ganga by almost around 56% since 1970s and one of the main reason as to why the base flow of the river has got reduced is because of construction of hydroelectric projects in the upper reaches of river ganga so if you have to construct the hydroelectric projects particularly in the upper reaches of river ganga we need to store water and if you store more amount of water in the upper reaches automatically less water would be made available in the lower reaches so when there is less amount of water in the lower reaches in that particular case even a small percentage of pollution will drastically increase the overall pollution in the river ganga and that is what is precisely happening so going forward we need to ensure that the minimum ecological flow is maintained in the river ganga at almost all the points along its course the next problem with respect to management of finances so normally when we criticize the government schemes initiatives etc we say that the government has not allocated sufficient amount of funds but in case of the namami gange it is exactly the opposite the government has undoubtedly allocated funds for this particular program but the problem here is the funds have so far remained unutilized for example according to a cag report between the years 2014-15 to 2016-17 almost around 60% of the funds which have been allocated for the namami gange project have remained unutilized apart from that the government has established the clean ganga fund in order to seek the contributions from the individuals companies nris for undertaking the cleaning and rejuvenation of river ganga but the problem once again here is the government has failed to utilize the entire amount of the clean ganga fund further only 48% of the funds which have been earmarked for afforestation have been used so going forward obviously the priority is whatever money which we have allocated that money it should be used efficiently and effectively we also need to encourage the higher funding by the respective state governments as well as the local bodies for example we need to encourage the local bodies to invest adequate amount of money in improving the sewage network this will ensure that the sewage treatment plants will function at their optimum capacity the next challenge is with respect to the implementation now actually the national ganga council which is headed by the prime minister it should meet as frequently as possible decide on the policy goals to be achieved it should undertake a review of the implementation of the policy goals and so on but normally it is observed that this national ganga council does not meet regularly the same thing can be said about the empowered task force which has been headed by the union minister for water resources even the empowered task force does not meet at a regular basis the last and most important part here is see when we talk about the ganga river basin as discussed before it is not just a river ganga but it is also about its tributaries as well but so far in the namami gange program we have focused more upon the main course of the river ganga we have not given adequate amount of emphasis on the tributaries of the river ganga see if you focus only on the main course of the river ganga and do not give adequate amount of focus on these tributaries then obviously namami gange program would not be successful we need to ensure that these tributaries also should be free of pollution we need to ensure that even these tributaries are rejuvenated 
So the Namami Gange program would be successful not just when the river Ganga gets rejuvenated, it will become successful when even the tributaries of river Ganga would also get rejuvenated. So these are some of the important aspects which you need to know with respect to this particular program. I hope now each of you would be able to go through these four prelims based questions for the practice and answer the questions. Please do let us know the answers in the comments section. The next article appears on page number 4. The article is titled as Rajasthan Free Rental Scheme for the Farm Tools as Success. This article shall be important from the perspective of GS Paper 3 Indian Economy. Now this particular article talks about a scheme which has been launched by the Rajasthan government. Under this particular scheme, the Rajasthan government is providing various agriculture machineries and tools such as tractors, sewing machines, etc on a rental basis to the small and marginal farmers. Under this particular scheme, the small and marginal farmers can simply rent out the tractors and sewing machines from the Rajasthan government without paying any additional cost. Now very rarely questions are asked in the UPC examinations with respect to the state specific schemes. But even then, this particular scheme of the Rajasthan government has a national level significance. Now, for example, while writing an answer in the UPSC mains examination on the Indian agriculture, you can use this particular scheme as a case study in order to enrich your answer. Secondly, if you have a look at the GS Paper 3 syllabus, you have different themes. And among the different themes, the most important theme happens to be the theme of Indian agriculture. As you can see in the last four year mains examination, it is the Indian agriculture which has been given the highest weightage. It is followed by the inclusive growth. Thirdly, see if you go back to 1970s, that time the overall agricultural production was quite lower. But since then, the agricultural production has drastically increased. India, from being a net importer, it has now become a net exporter of food grains. India is also considered to be one of the largest producers of food grains as well as fruits and vegetables. In spite of an increase in the overall production, the income levels of the farmers has not increased commensurately. This is on account of mainly three reasons. These reasons have been identified by the Committee on Doubling of Farmers Income. Reason number one is the input cost in the Indian agriculture has increased. In particular, the input cost on seeds, fertilizers, and in particular, labor cost has increased. Secondly, the overall productivity of agricultural land, that is the overall yield of agricultural land, this has got reduced. This is on account of fragmentation of the agricultural land. And last is because of the lower prices received by the farmers. And if you look at the nature of questions which have been asked on the Indian agriculture, predominantly questions are focused on these three aspects of inputs productivity and the prices. For example, as you can see in mains 2014, there was a question with respect to the water. So water is one of the inputs. Similarly, one can expect a question related to the agricultural mechanization. For example, question can be asked with respect to various dimensions of agriculture mechanization, such as the need, benefits and challenges. Accordingly, a mains question for practice for you here would be, the mechanization of Indian agriculture could prove to be a double-edged sword. Keeping this in mind, examine as to how the agricultural mechanization can be improved. I have already discussed the topic of agricultural mechanization in the DNA stated 9th of August 2020. So what I would do here is, I would attach the previous DNS video for the revision. Coming to the first dimension that is the need for promotion of the agricultural mechanization. Now, according to some of the experts, one of the primary reasons for the present agrarian distress has been attributed to the increase in the labor cost. Hence, by adopting agriculture mechanized tools, the need for employing agriculture labor would reduce, leading to the reduction in the input cost. Secondly, if you look at the share of the small and marginal farmers in case of India, they account for almost up to 83% of the farmers and they hold almost up to 40% of the agricultural land. 
However, since the agriculture land holding is quite fragmented and small, the overall efficiency of the agriculture land as such is quite poor. Hence, by promoting agricultural mechanization in the smaller and the fragmented land holdings of the small and marginal farmers, we would be able to enhance the overall efficiency of the agricultural land. Further, in the recent years, a large number of rural males have migrated to the urban areas in search of employment opportunities. This in turn has led to the increase in the share of the women farmers in the Indian agriculture. Now this is referred to as the feminization of the Indian agriculture. According to some of the experts, presently the Indian agriculture accounts for almost up to 33% of the women farmers. So going forward, we need to adopt gender friendly agricultural machines and tools to make it easier for the women farmers to take up the agriculture. Thirdly, by using agriculture mechanization techniques such as the use of harvesters, tractors, etc. The farmers would be able to harvest their crop more faster and this would in turn enable them to grow multiple crops in a single year leading to increase in their income level. Agriculture mechanization will also help the farmers in the judicious use of other inputs such as seeds, fertilizers, etc. Now as per the Dalvai panel, the adoption of agriculture mechanization has a potential to reduce the input cost by 25% enhance the productivity by 20% leading to a overall increase in the income levels of the farmers by almost up to 25 to 30%. Keeping in mind various benefits associated with agriculture mechanization, the government of India has launched the submission on agriculture mechanization. Now this is a submission under the national mission on agricultural extension and technology. Now if you look at tractors, harvesters, etc. they are quite costly and hence they cannot be bought by the poor farmers. So what we have done under the submission on agriculture mechanization is that we have set up the custom hiring centers at the village level. Now through the custom hiring centers, the small and marginal farmers as well as the poor farmers can hire various agriculture machines and tools on a temporary basis. These custom hiring centers are in turn managed by the rural youths. So in a way, on one hand, the custom hiring centers are promoting agricultural mechanization and on the other hand, they are promoting employment opportunities for the local youths. Now, in spite of these benefits associated with the agricultural mechanization, the green revolution has shown us that agricultural mechanization would have an adverse impact on environment. It can have a social as well as economic cost. That is why the Committee on Doubling of Farmers' Income has highlighted that the agriculture mechanization can as such emerge as a double-edged sword. That is, on one hand, it can have a number of benefits, while on the other hand, if it is not judiciously employed, then it can lead to an adverse impact. Now, for example, as the Green Revolution has shown us, the introduction of agricultural pump sets, which is considered to be a form of agricultural mechanization, has led to the higher exploitation of the ground water. Similarly, the introduction of combined harvesters has led to the increase in the instances of the stubble burning leading to the increase in the air pollution. Then the smoke form machines has led to the increase in the air pollution in the rural areas. Then the use of heavy machineries has also led to the soil erosion. As far as the social cost is concerned, the deployment of agricultural machineries could lead to the displacement of the unskilled labor leading to the increase in the unemployment. Similarly, right now the agriculture mechanized tools as such are not gender friendly and hence they go against the feminization of the Indian agriculture. Thirdly, the agriculture machines and tools as such are quite costly. So if you look at the small and marginal farmers, usually the banks are reluctant to give loans to the small and marginal farmers. So because of which the small and marginal farmers rely on the money lenders for the loans to buy various agriculture machines and tools. So this in a way lead to a vicious cycle of debt. So the question here is how do we address these problems with the agriculture mechanization in order to ensure that the agriculture mechanization is more inclusive, sustainable as well as environment friendly. So first and foremost we have to address the needs of the small and marginal farmers. 
So in order to do this, we have to set up more number of custom hiring centers. Similarly, recently the government of India has unveiled an Uber-like app for the farmers. So just like how you can use an Uber to book a cab, this particular app can be used by the farmers in order to book agriculture machines and tools on a rental basis. So going forward, we need to expand the footprint of the custom hiring centers in the village level and also ensure that more number of farmers come on board and adopt this particular app. Secondly, we need to focus upon the environment friendly machines such as the happy seeders to make agriculture mechanization more sustainable and environment friendly. Thirdly, as stated before, the banks as such are reluctant to give loans to small and marginal farmers to buy various agriculture machines and tools. So in order to address this particular problem, the government should come out with a direct benefits transfer to give money to small and marginal farmers to buy various agricultural machines. Fourthly, as highlighted before, there is a possibility that the introduction of agriculture machines and tools could lead to the displacement of the unskilled labor. So we need to focus upon the skilling of the rural youths so that such rural youths can be in turn absorbed into the Indian manufacturing sector. And lastly, the Committee on Doubling of Farmers' Income has highlighted that so far, as far as agriculture mechanization is concerned, we are focused traditionally on introduction of agriculture machines and tools. So going forward, we need to go beyond the traditional concept of agriculture mechanization and adopt the advanced technologies such as the satellite technology, artificial intelligence, big data, etc. So these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article. The next article appears on page number 6. The article is titled as Empowering the Nature with the Biocentric Jurisprudence. This article is multidimensional in nature and would become important from the perspective of GS Paper 2, Paper 3 as well as Paper 4. I hope all of you must have heard about the Great Indian Bustards. The Great Indian Bustards are the critically endangered bird species predominantly found in the states of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Since 1970s, there has been 75% decline in the population of Great Indian Bustards. Obviously, there are a number of reasons for their decline in their population, but the most important reason happens to be their frequent collision with the high-tension overhead power lines. So, the Great Indian Bustards are basically large birds. Being large birds, they usually take low flights. And because of the low flights, they frequently collide with the high tension power lines leading to their deaths. In this regard, recently the Supreme Court of India has issued the direction to the state governments to install the bird diverters in order to check their deaths. In this regard, this particular article here highlights that this particular judgment of the Supreme Court is in line with the biocentrism view of the environmental ethics. So let's try to understand as to what is biocentrism and how is it different from the anthropocentrism? Both of these two can be considered as a kind of environmental ethics. See, in order to protect the environment in case of India, the constitution has come up with an elaborate framework. This framework has been laid on both as part of the fundamental duties as well as the directive principles of state policy. Now the question is, how should we interpret these framework in order to protect the environment. So in order to interpret the various laws, provisions, etc., we can basically take two views in order to protect the environment. One is the anthropocentrism and the other one is biocentrism. Anthropocentrism view of protecting the environment, it is usually considered to be a narrow view of environment. This is so because it is basically focused upon promotion of human welfare. So it keeps human beings as a basic central point. It attaches highest level of importance to human beings. On the other hand, biocentrism, its scope is much more broader in comparison to anthropocentrism. This is because biocentrism is not just focused upon the promotion of human welfare. Rather, it is focused upon the promotion of welfare of all the living beings. So be it humans, be it plants, be it animals, all the living beings need to be protected as part of biocentrism. So it gives equal importance to all the living beings. Whereas 
the anthropocentrism gives highest level of importance to human beings nextly see if you look at anthropocentrism according to anthropocentrism we need to protect the environment because it is good for the human well being which means that if you are unable to protect the environment if the environmental degradation starts taking place then it will have an adverse impact on the well being of the human beings for example according to anthropocentrism we need to control air pollution simply because the growing air pollution will lead to the death of human beings so sees everything from the perspective of the impact it has on the human beings when it comes to biocentrism according to biocentrism we need to protect environment not because it will have an adverse impact on the human well being we need to protect environment because just like how human beings have their own rights even the environment has its own set of rights and we should not violate these rights so here according to biocentrism we are protecting environment not because it is needed for protecting the human well being we are protecting the environment because it is a moral imperative just like human beings even the environment has its own set of rights and hence we should not violate the rights of the environment last and most important is the perspective of environmental protection according to anthropocentrism environmental protection is a means to an end the end here is obviously human welfare and the means here is the environmental protection so we need to protect environment because it leads to higher well being of the individuals however according to biocentrism environmental protection is a end in itself so here we are not treating the environment as a means to certain ends here the environmental protection is considered as a end in itself once again this is so because environment has its own set of rights now according to the author of this particular article the recent supreme court judgment on the installation of the bird diverters to check the death of the great indian buster this particular judgment of the supreme court can be considered as a biocentric view of indian law so basically here the supreme court has interpreted the indian law in a biocentric way in order to give equal importance to all the living beings please do note that this is not the first time that the courts have given a biocentric interpretation of the indian laws even prior to this a number of high courts have given the biocentric interpretation take for instance the uttarakhand high court had decided to declare ganga and yamuna as legal persons so just like how you and me being living persons we have certain legal rights and duties similarly ganga and yamuna they would also have their own set of rights and duties now for example if my rights are getting violated in that particular case i can directly approach the courts similarly if the rights of ganga and yamuna are getting violated then they can also approach the courts now for example let's say there is a industry which is polluting the waters of the river ganga in that particular case river ganga can actually represent itself before the court now in order to do so the ganga and yamuna river they will be considered as minors who are under the in charge of guardians or parents in this particular case the parent could be the director of namami gange project so the director of the namami gange project on behalf of ganga can actually approach the court against the violation of its rights so this is a biocentric interpretation of the law where we have decided to consider the rivers as legal persons similar to that the chandigarh high court had decided to declare the sukhna lake in chandigarh as a living entity please do let us know in the comment section as to which country has become the first country in the world to give a legal status to its river obviously it is not india it is some other country so please do let us know in the comments section apart from that the other countries which have adopted a biocentric view of environment include ecuador which became the first country in the world to recognize the rights of the nature in its own constitution similarly the pittsburgh became the first municipality in the world to recognize the rights of the nature now as to how you can use this particular aspect related to biocentrism 
Now probably you can use this in order to substantiate your case study in the ethics. You can use this as a kind of fodder point while writing an answer in the GS paper 3 environment. And you can also use this in GS paper 2 as to how the Supreme Court of India and various high courts have interpreted various laws in order to strengthen the environmental protection. So this particular article here can be used in multiple dimensions. With this, let's move on to the next article. The next article appears on page number one. The article is titled as Supreme Court upholds the National Green Tribunal ban on the firecrackers. This article shall be important from the perspective of GS paper to polity and governance. See in December 2020, the National Green Tribunal had decided to ban the bursting of firecrackers. It had allowed only the bursting of the green crackers. In this regard, a group of petitioners had approached the Supreme Court to strike down the order issued by the National Green Tribunal. But as you can see, this particular article here highlights that the Supreme Court of India has upheld the order issued by the National Green Tribunal. In fact, the Supreme Court of India has reminded the petitioners of its order which it had issued in the year 2018. So let us try to understand about the Supreme Court order on the nationwide ban on crackers which it had issued in the year 2018. Now as to why it becomes important from the perspective of the examination, as you can see in Mains 2015 there was a direct question related to the relationship between Article 21 and the burning of crackers during Diwali. So let's try to understand this particular issue in detail. See with respect to nationwide ban on bursting of crackers, we can give both arguments as well as content arguments. Now for example, the arguments in favor of having a ban on crackers include first and foremost, see the bursting of crackers especially during Diwali, New Year celebrations etc. This leads to increase in air pollution. In particular, this leads to a drastic increase in the particulate matter concentration and this can have an adverse impact on the health of the people. Particularly, it can lead to breathing problems, bronchitis, etc. Similarly, the cracker manufacturing industry uses sulfur as a raw material in the crackers. So when the crackers are burst, this leads to the emission of the sulfur dioxide, which is considered to be a harmful gas. And lastly, see the cracker manufacturing industry employs a large number of children. So this obviously goes against the interests of children. When it comes to counter arguments against the nationwide ban on crackers, these are the counter arguments which have been put forward by the cracker manufacturing industry. The first counter argument here is that a nationwide ban on crackers would go against the fundamental right to practice profession. As you know, Article 19 Clause G provides a fundamental right to the Indian citizens to practice their own profession. So, the cracker manufacturing industry argues that if you put a nationwide ban on crackers, they would not be able to manufacture and sell the crackers and this would go against Article 19 Clause G. Secondly, it has also been counter-argued that it is not the bursting of crackers which alone is a reason for the growing air pollution. Apart from the bursting of crackers, obviously there are a number of other reasons which have contributed to the growing air pollution. So take for instance the industrial pollution, the vehicular pollution, stubble burning etc. Now to control the air pollution, you don't ban these activities. That is we don't ban industrial activities, we don't ban the movement of vehicles. So why put a ban on bursting of crackers? More importantly, crackers as such are not burnt or burst throughout the year. They are actually burst during a specific time. Let's say for example, New Year celebrations, Diwali celebrations, etc. Nextly, it has also been counter-argued that a nationwide ban on crackers would lead to loss of livelihood opportunities for families who are employed in the cracker manufacturing industry. And this will also lead to a revenue loss of approximately around rupees 6,000 crores to the state government. So basically here, there were both arguments as well as counter arguments in favor as well as against the nationwide ban on crackers. So this was a petition which was filed before the Supreme Court. So here, the Supreme Court had a dilemma in this particular case. The dilemma was between Article 21, which is right to life and 
आर्टिकल नाइनटीन क्लॉज जी विच इज राइट टू प्रोफेशन to this you can also add the dilemma which is coming into picture because of article 25 which deals with the freedom to practice one's own religion so basically here the supreme court had to choose between the multiple fundamental rights which are at stake now it is being said that in this particular order the supreme court has done a fine balancing act between various fundamental rights on one hand the supreme court has allowed the manufacture and sale of crackers thus upholding article 19 clause g as well as article 25 but at the same time it has imposed reasonable restrictions on bursting of crackers and thus it has upheld article 21 as well so let's understand as to how the supreme court has done this fine balancing act see first and foremost the supreme court has said that the normal crackers as such should not be manufactured going forward only the green crackers should be manufactured so the green crackers are basically those crackers which use eco friendly raw materials secondly they would not use harmful chemicals for example the supreme court has banned the usage of barium in the fire crackers now barium is a chemical which actually gives out the green color when you burst the crackers now even though the usage of the barium in the fire crackers it's considered to be quite attractive it gives out green color but it is considered to be a harmful chemical that is why the supreme court has decided to put a ban on the usage of barium in the crackers the supreme court expects that the usage of the green crackers would be able to reduce the particulate matter pollution by approximately around 30 to 35 percent so obviously here as you can see the supreme court has done a fine balancing between article 21 versus article 25 versus article 19 clause g apart from that the supreme court has decided to regulate the sale of crackers for which it has decided to appoint the petroleum and explosive safety organization as a nodal agency now the petroleum explosives and safety organization has been entrusted with the responsibility to ensure that whatever crackers are sold in india these crackers should be manufactured only by using the permitted chemicals for example the peso would ensure that the crackers should not use barium as a chemical further the supreme court has come out with a defined time for bursting of crackers for example during diwali it has set the time of 8 to 10 pm similarly for christmas also it has fixed a definite time limit apart from that the supreme court has also called upon the government to encourage the community fire cracking that is we should choose a particular place a common place where all the people can come together and burst the crackers in order to minimize the air pollution so this was the supreme court judgment with respect to the nationwide ban on crackers so this particular judgment of supreme court is considered to be a landmark case since here the supreme court was required to decide on how we would have to give interpretation to the multiple fundamental rights which are in conflict with each other so this is what you have to know with respect to this particular article now the next article appears on page number 6 in the form of a editorial the article is titled as written to troubles this article shall be important from the perspective of gs paper 2 international relations so this particular article is with respect to uk in particular it talks about two important agreements the first one being the good friday agreement which was signed way back in the year 1998 and the second one being the northern ireland protocol agreement that has come into being as part of the brexit deal between uk and european union so let's first understand about the good friday agreement and then about the north ireland protocol agreement so there is no need for you to get into the detail aspects of these agreements on a broader level if you understand as to what these agreements are all about that would be sufficient from the perspective of the upsc prelims examination so let's understand the good friday agreement first see when we say uk uk basically comprises of england wales scotland and northern ireland whereas the republic of ireland it is a separate country however the republic of ireland earlier it was part of uk but now it is a separate country so as you can see the northern ireland it is part of uk whereas the southern part of ireland it is a separate country 
Now in the Northern Ireland, there are basically two factions. One is the Unionist and the other one is Nationalist. The Unionist basically wants that the Northern Ireland should continue to remain part of UK. Whereas Nationalists want that the Northern Ireland should become part of the Republic of Ireland. So basically there are two factions and both the factions have contrasting objectives. Wherein the Unionist wants that the Northern Ireland should be part of UK. Whereas the Nationalists want that the Northern Ireland should become part of the Republic of Ireland. Now these two factions in the Northern Ireland were in violent clashes since 1970s. And finally, these violent clashes ended in the year 1998 with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. So what exactly is this Good Friday Agreement? See, basically here, the UK wanted to pacify the nationalists. It wanted to keep away the separatist tendencies. So basically, UK, in order to keep away the separatist tendencies, allowed greater movement of goods between the Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. So the idea behind the Good Friday Agreement was to promote greater economic integration between the Northern Ireland, which is part of UK, and the Republic of Ireland, which is a separate country. Apart from the Good Friday Agreement, you must understand here that both UK as well as the Republic of Ireland, both of these two countries were part of the European Union, that is EU. So because both these countries were part of European Union, there was a greater movement of goods, greater movement of services, a greater amount of trade integration between the Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. So far, so good. Until the Brexit came into being. As you know, the Brexit here refers to the withdrawal of UK from the European Union. Now, what this means is Wales, England, Scotland and more importantly the Northern Ireland are no longer part of the European Union. So, so far there was free movement of goods, services and greater economic integration between Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland. Now, because of Brexit, such free movement of goods and services cannot take place. That is why the Brexit provided for the North Ireland Protocol Agreement. So, as part of the North Ireland Protocol Agreement, the goods can move freely between the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So, here under the agreement, it has been provided that no custom checkpoints would be set up along this particular border. But at the same time here, if the goods have to move from the rest of UK to Northern Ireland, custom checkpoints have been established at the important port locations in the Northern Ireland. So now what has happened here is, it has become quite easier for the free movement of goods between these two islands. But it has become quite difficult for the goods from rest of UK to enter into Northern Ireland. So this has gone against the interest of the private sector which is operating in rest of UK. So for the private sector which is operating in rest of UK, it has become quite difficult to send the goods to the Northern Ireland. This is so because now the goods would have to pass through the custom checkpoints which in turn leads to huge amount of delays. That is why UK has now started asking the European Union for the renegotiation of the Northern Ireland Protocol Agreement. So basically this is a developing story. So let's wait and watch as to what would happen. So as far as your prelims examination is concerned, as discussed before, there is no need for you to get into these aspects. On a broader level, if you understand about the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol Agreement, that alone should be sufficient. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let us have a look at the question for the day. Now the answer to the question that was asked in yesterday's DNS is option D.